In discussing the settlement of international issues after the First World War, I think context is pretty much everything. Our understanding of the Middle East must, it seems to me, fit into the larger context of what historians call the new imperialism carried out by the West from the 1860s to World War I. The new imperialism generally started with individuals on the ground who presented, uh, represented particular business or other interests and who called for the support of their governments when their security was threatened in these faraway places. The European governments in question then, or the related government, would then intervene militarily in the situation and, and plant the flag to protect its nationals or to restore order. Especially in the conquest of more modernized regions, the Western power might take advantage of loans made by some allied or related financial institution, loans often calculated as next to impossible to repay, and then force the country later to accept a European financial regime, which could in turn become a full-fledged colonial government. Now, it should be pointed out here that the financial interests working hand in glove with the growing bureaucratic state not only welcomed, but pushed for policies of strong economic intervention, both at home and in the colonies, since their influence and power depended on the manipulation of the state's resources. For their own part, the great international banks that increasingly stood behind this process began to develop uh, very, very complicated strategies for imperialism by the last years of the 19th century. In connection with the revolutions that broke out in a number of countries just after the turn of the 19th century, so Russia, 1905, Persia, 1905, Ottoman, Turkey, 1908, etc., etc., the, this global, or these global brains trusts began to work out elaborate schemes for pooling resources, dividing the markets in the conquered areas, and doing planning on a very vast strategic scale, <clears throat> as in the Chinese consortium loan just before World War I. These imperializing teams became expert at the public relations of manipulating collectivist nationalism, both at home and in colonial uh, areas, sometimes using uh, upstart proto-nationalist leaders to topple older regimes standing in the way, and then removing or controlling the new local leader. Not only did Western bankers and arms makers stand behind the revolts, but they got in on the ground floor of controlling wealth flows under the new regime, whatever it turned out to be. So where was the Middle East in all of this? <clears throat> um, well, the, the Ottoman Empire, uh, which you see pictured uh, uh, up here, it's labeled Turkey. The Ottoman Empire protected a very large part of the region to some extent and warded off outright conquest from the West before 1914. So it was in the Middle Eastern states that lay outside Ottoman control where the new imperialism first struck, that is, Egypt and Persia. Egypt had been more or less independent from the empire, uh, yet the building of the Suez Canal, the British closeness of uh, uh, to Egypt uh, connected with the canal, British loans, and British desires to control uh, the best route to India. All these factors led to near protectorate status for Egypt. Persia, on the other hand, an old but surprisingly cohesive state trying to modernize itself, was simply caught between Russian and British imperialisms and uh, divided in the happy moment of the Triple Entente, famous for being the predestined allies together, uh, 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 brought together in 1907 so they could fight the Germans seven years later. Oil enters the picture at this juncture. British oil exploration had been going on in Persia since 1901. Uh, one year after the British and Russians divided Persia into spheres of influence in 1907, the British discovered there one of the largest oil fields in the world. The British government immediately helped to organize the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, a private concern closely tied to the British government. Meanwhile, that great creature of empire, Winston Churchill, became first lord of the Admiralty in 1911, and accelerated an existing program to convert the Royal Navy from coal power to petroleum. Anglo-Persian oil company officials argued at this stage that if their company was not subsidized by the British government, uh, then Royal Dutch Shell or Standard Oil uh, might well move in to uh, compete. 
Churchill was able, just before World War I, to gain parliamentary approval for the British government to buy a controlling share of Anglo-Persian at the same time that the Navy was finishing its conversion to oil power. The British government thus became the company's controlling shareholder and its biggest, comp- uh, biggest customer. More generally, the world was shifting to oil as the basis of power production, though it does give one pause to contemplate the possible uh, alternative uh, paths of energy history um, if petroleum production had not from its infancy relied on aggressive rent-seeking behavior. Hence, in any case, the great modern oil companies that emerged from World War I, in particular Royal Dutch Shell under the leadership of uh, Henry Detterning, uh, who uh, took over the company uh, and brought it into the British fold during World War I and was knighted as, uh, uh, by the British during the war. Um, hence Standard Oil Company and various other branches of the Rockefeller uh, Empire and some others. Here indeed is the beginning of that shift in financial power discussed by Rothbard in in the context of the 1930s, a a shift in which the Rockefeller interests moved ahead of the J.P. Morgan empire. Indeed, the partly state-sponsored increase in the need for oil allowed a whole range of tycoons, frustrated academics, slick operators, retired admirals, arms merchants, and others to create policy and in the case of our subject, to shape strategies for Western policies in the Middle East, since that is where the greatest known oil reserves now appear to be. To clarify, if I'm critical of these freewheeling companies and individuals who shaped Western foreign policies, it's not because I'm critical of the influence of free market business impacting government decisions. Um, Rather the opposite, I'm critical because these forces were instrumental in forging the statist regimes of the 20th century and beyond. As historian Gareth Jones somewhat approvingly commented on the British case during the period of World War I, quote, the assault on laissez-faire was partly led by private industry itself. One of the most noticeable assaults came from the British oil companies. The famous British wartime promises that shaped the modern Middle East (coughs) were very much a part of this world of slick operators, bureaucrats, and imperialists. These promises were briefly as follows. The Hussein-McMahon correspondence from 1915-1916. This amounted to a British promise uh, to support independent Arab governments after the war. The pivotal Sykes-Picot Agreement of May 1916 divided up the Ottoman Empire after the war, assigned, assigning Syria to France and Iraq and Palestine to Britain. And then the Balfour Declaration of 1917 declared British support for the establishment of a national homeland for Jews in Palestine. Note that these commitments were mutually exclusive in a variety of ways and certainly impossible uh, to keep. By the time of the peace conference in Paris, countries lined up to acquire parts of the Ottoman Empire, which was, of course, on the losing side. In the queue of those seeking pieces of this particular rock were Italy, Greece, the Arab dynasty of uh, Faisal, Persia, um, certain Armenian political organizations, France, Britain, and some others. In the end, outside of the newly slimmed down Turkey, European power became dominant, above all, uh, British power. Let Let me focus now on a single issue by looking for a moment at the question of the Mosul boundary, which was a part of this whole peacemaking process. So it's kind of a microcosm of of, uh, my point here. This region on the border of three successor states... Uh, to the Ottoman Empire and Persia became an important diplomatic issue, but an even more important financial one. And just to just to show, let me uh, just point out uh, this uh, this is the region we're talking about uh, in this area. In other words, it's where uh, it's where um, uh, Turkey meets Syria meets Iraq meets Persia. Okay, so it's a it's a kind of borderland among three among four different uh, modern uh, countries. It was all Ottoman Empire except for the Persian part beforehand. And you'll see here it's called uh, in this older mid uh, 19th century map Kurdistan, uh, which is just an older way to spell Kurdistan. And um, 
Then here we have mountain Nestorians, and Nestorians are of course Christians, and this is a reference to those Assyrians who lived there and were uh, descendants of the the famous Assyrians, but had become Christianized. So it was it was they were called here uh, mountain Nestorians. Um, so that's the region we're talking about, and this map is a this map is an older uh, uh, map where you get a better sense of this being not carved into arbitrary uh, nation states in the 20th century. Um, the district named after the city of Mosul, and there's a little uh, plan of the city of Mosul, and you see also right here, oops, sorry, also uh, here are the ancient uh, ruins of Nineveh uh, in the, within the city. Um, but uh, this is a, uh, and then a modern map of uh, the region to show how those countries come to come together. But the district named after Mosul was a vilayet or province of the Ottoman Empire, home to a, a wide ethnic variety, Arabs, Assyrians, Ar Armenians, and others. The predominant ethnic stock was Kurdish. These peoples had lived in isolation until the mid-19th century when the Ottomans crushed their last resistance to centralized rule. Um, still, the Vilayet of Mosul, especially the northern section of it, was a remote mountain area, including some of the least known terrain in the world from the standpoint of European geographers uh, by the early 20th century. But there was also the promise of oil. Famous tar and gas seepages in the area had attracted serious attention since the 1870s. Um, just before World War I, um, these were, there were positive indications of a vast oil field close to Kirkuk, just uh, south and east of, um, of Mosul. Uh, and an American rear admiral, Colby Chester, having visited the region in 1899, smelled oil and returned as a private entrepreneur a few years later to lobby with the Ottoman Sultan for just uh, such an oil con concession as British adventurers were negotiating at the same time with Persia. After much talk between Chester and the Ottomans, um, suddenly off, from off stage, the Anglo-Persian Oil Company and uh, some Deutsche Bank suitors appeared in Istanbul and the famous Red Sultan, uh, Abdul Hamid, as he was uh, Red Sultan, he was called because of the blood on his hands, uh, surmising the value of the area, quickly transferred the Mosul province from state ownership to his own private property. The Sultan was about to sell both to the Germans and the British, but the Young Turk Revolution of 1908 intervened. Um, actually, Chester, the admiral, secured from the new Young Turk regime um, a promise of future acquisitions uh, or future oil concession uh, uh, complete. But in 1912, the British and the Germans founded the Turkish Petroleum Company, a concern which went out of business when the First World War started, but uh, which is going to reemerge uh, after the war. Once the war began, so did planning for the post-war settlement, as we've seen, and both the British and French kept the Mosul border in mind as they redesigned the region. The Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1916 represented for the French not only control over historic Syria, but also the potential for exploitation of Mosul. Whether the British intended to stick by this promise, the issue of whether Mosul and its resources would end up in Syria, Iraq, or Turkey became more and more disputed as the end of the war approached. Strangely, just as the war ended, France renounced its claim to the Mosul district in a puzzling move. Uh, maybe France hoped to keep the whole Sykes-Picot agreement intact by giving away a part of it uh, uh, so that the British would support them <coughs> in other areas, or maybe so that the British would support them in Europe. Probably the French renounced uh, an immediate claim to Mosul because um, the government was following a complex plan featuring Sir Basil Zaharoff, international man of mystery, arms merchant extraordinaire, supplier of both sides in World War I, and by the end of the war, an agent of British petroleum interests. Zaharoff, it seems, induced Clemenceau and other French figures to renounce Mosul so that it would be available to the new, nearly fully British, Royal Dutch Shell, although he was able to offer the French <coughs> a share of the profits. Zaharoff had a good bit of experience in this area as an agent of the Rothschild oil interests in Tsarist Russia uh, earlier in the century. 
Uh, moreover, much of the famous arms merchants' activities at the end of the war were directed toward a complex scheme of getting up a bank for the exploitation of Middle Eastern oil, which was actually an international uh, bank, and 45% of which would be owned by the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. Um, connected, with, uh, connected with these Anglo-French uh, dispositions over the Mosul boundary, Standard Oil had taken active measures to associate itself with the French oil market and with French oil policy generally. And so Standard became a kind of standard bearer for the French because that enabled them to edge out the British uh, uh, just a little bit. Uh, to make things more complicated, exciting times followed. In early 1920, Faisal became a king of Syria, made so by a Syrian council. But the Allied San Remo Conference confirmed France's control of Syria, and the French then um, defeated Faisal's forces uh, and expelled him from the country. Then he moved on to become king of Iraq. Uh, the story behind these events, though, is that before the French and British met to conclude the mandate uh, system at San Remo, the British had offered an oil peace which would appease the French, uh, but which left out the Americans in any form. So the deal now was <clears throat> Mosul to be split in just in terms of the oil concessions, 75-25 British and French. Should be mentioned here that the Mosul Vilayet had been promised, in essence, to the Hashemites, to Faisal's family, um, and had been occupied by the British uh, since late 1918. Um, so it was now left under Hashemite Iraq, as it remains to this day, or, uh, or in Iraq, as it remains to this day. But in reality, it was in the hands of the British to be exploited mostly by Sir Henry Detterding of Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, well, uh, to to move through uh, some elements of this paper that uh, that are very interesting, the, another aspect of this uh, that I'll touch on just briefly before I close is that um, that there was a huge war in this area that most Americans are not particularly aware of uh, in 1921-1922 uh, uh, when the Greeks invaded Turkey, the French invaded Turkey, what was left of Turkey. Uh, uh, there were parts of Turkey internationalized, and um, a, a huge attack uh, by the Greeks uh, with forces of two or three hundred thousand troops uh, fighting by the middle of 1920. Uh, the Turks uh, armed, uh, they brought a famous general, Mustafa Kemal, the man who later was renamed Ataturk, uh, to the fore. He was a great general. He beat the Greeks. They withdrew. And uh, uh, so there's, there's this huge rumble that, uh, that happened there. Uh, behind these events stood oil, <clears throat> that of Mosul in particular, um, just as the British, uh, uh, a, a, well, actually the British were financing the Greek attack uh, through uh, Zaharov, and Standard Oil was was uh, in support of the Turkish government. Uh, I have uh, some quotations about that from contemporary times. A lot of contemporaries realize this, but uh, in any case, uh, I will cut to the chase because my time is uh, is is running out. Um, this was eventually settled, although the Mosul boundary was a problem up until 1926 when that was finally settled to the uh, temporary satisfaction. Um, but let me, uh, after moving on from this example, just close the paper with a couple of, uh, a couple of points here. Um, first, in the period after World War I, the British and the French maintained strategies in the Middle East which relied on manipulating individuals and groups for political and economic and strategic purposes, and the British surpassed everybody. Second, by the de second decade of the 20th century, the manipulation of wealth in enormous increments involved in the new imperialism uh, had led to new, long-range, and often uh, extremely callous strategies for, con uh, for the control of investments and market fields. The not completely adventitious arise, rise of oil to supreme importance in the leading industrial countries led to still more elaboration of such long-range plans. Third, many of the post-war arrangements could not have been calculated more readily for instability. If not from all parties, at least on the part of some, the groundwork in this period was laid for certain political manipulation later on, for later violence, and especially for taking advantage of such violence as a foothold for further stages in strategic planning. 
Um, finally, in a very real sense, all these strategies depended on the division of the region along fairly precise lines, as illustrated in the Mosul boundary. The post-Ottoman Middle East might have reshaped itself in a variety of ways after the empire fell, if it, if it fell at all. But the divisions like those imposed worked both toward profit for others and a special intensification of violence in the modern world. It is perhaps too much to claim that the whole script for a century's worth of Middle Eastern affairs was written in the years just after World War I, but I think a rough draft of it was. <laughs>